Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this show. As proudly we hail the Jet Indoctrination Course students and instructors at the Pilot Instructor School, Craig Air Force Base, Selma, Alabama. This is the age of change in the air, from propellers to jets. Today, jet planes are commonplace, and the special problems and challenges they present must be met at every Air Force base. The commanding officers of these bases, the jet squadron commanders, the mass pilots who ferry the jet planes, and many others must not only know propeller-driven aircraft, but also the jet. And so, your Air Force has set up a special training school for them, the Jet Indoctrination Course. Proudly, we hail the Jet Indoctrination School, Selma, Alabama. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Young man, there's a future in flight for you. Today's jet age offers unlimited opportunities for young men between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half who are high school graduates and otherwise qualified. Yes, you can proudly wear the silver wings and fly the mighty aircraft of your United States Air Force when you've completed your training. For full details, visit your nearest Air Force base or your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station tomorrow. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, 76 Hours. Here's my sixth solo mission card, Captain. Well, how'd it go today, General? Fine. Did about two dozen turns at altitudes up to 15,000 at 96% power, loops at 425 miles per hour. Have any trouble with him, sir? Not with a jet. That T-33 is a sweet plane to fly. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see. You did those Cuban 8s at 425 and the Immelmans at 425, huh? Ran down the whole card. Landed with 83 gallons, according to the gauge. Well, sir, that's it. You're a graduate of the jet indoctrination course. I say, Jim... Can I speak to you for a minute? Oh, hello, General. How's it coming, sir? We've lost him. What do you mean, lost him? That's right. I'm afraid I'm out. Mm Mm-hmm. He's an ex-student now, a graduate. He just completed his sixth solo. Oh, congratulations, General Harlan. Thank you, Major Warner. Now, this jet course has been quite a challenge to me. I've enjoyed it very much. Now, that's a fine recommendation. Uh, Would you excuse me for a moment, sir? Say, Captain, here's something which will interest you. Uh Uh-huh. Last-minute addition to new class, Colonel Frank Kennedy, arriving from Washington today at 1,500 hours. What? Thought it just might be your father. Well, it is, but I thought he was at the Pentagon for life. Well, I think he's already arrived. There was a call at operations for you about half an hour ago. Let's see, it's 5 o'clock now. He must have landed while I was up with Major Griggs on his first dual ride. When you see Colonel Kennedy, would you give my regards? We're old friends from the staff school. Certainly, sir. I hope you two can get together before you go on to your new command at Clovis. Would you gentlemen excuse me? I'd like to go find Dad. Congratulations again, General. It's been a pleasure to have you in the school. Uh, Certainly, Captain. If your reports are in, you're through for the day. Take off. Holy cow, I almost forgot. Forgot what? Gloria, my wife, she'll want to have the old man to dinner. Ah, Clear the phone. Domestic crisis looming at the Kennedy household. Kennedy? Yes? Jim! Oh, hiya, Dad. What, what are you uh, doing down here? Well, well son, I, I I just got tired of sitting behind a desk at the Pentagon. There's a new jet fighter wing being formed at Great Falls. I requested a transfer and finally got it. <laughs> Gee, how does Mother feel about it? Oh, she's acting like a bride. She's still in Washington closing up the house and arranging for the moving men. She'll be down here before we go west. Oh, you're looking great. <laughs> yeah, well, so are you. <laughs> Well, how's Glory? Just fine. 
Which reminds me, she's expecting us both home to dinner at six. Wonderful. I've been looking forward to some of her fried chicken ever since I knew I was coming to Selma. Now, how come you got down here so last minute? Your name wasn't on the original class roster. Oh, it was touch and go in Washington. First, they said they couldn't spare me. Oh, you know what that's like. Well, most of the students arrive the Friday before classes begin. Well, you know, that gives them the whole weekend to look around. Here it is Tuesday, and school starts tomorrow. Well, then I'll have less time to get nervous. Oh, oh, nervous? You? You know, all the times I was overseas during the war, all the combat missions, all the flights and bombings, I was never as scared as I am right now. Now, I'm not a kid, Jim. For three weeks, I'm going to be in a whole new world of flying, a young man's world. I want to be part of this world, but maybe I'm too old. That's enough to worry anybody, don't you think? Oh, not you, Dad. For you, it'll be duck soup. Thanks. I wish I were as sure of it as you. Well, one thing I am sure of, though, is that it's nice to have a son with that much faith in his old man. <laughs> Come on, let's eat. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the Jet Indoctrination Course in Building 213, your headquarters for the next three weeks. As Captain Kennedy here can tell you, you're going to work hard, but you're also going to have fun. I'm Major Warner, Walter Warner. I'm the commander of the school. May I present Captain Kennedy? Good morning. Now, you're going to have 76 hours of actual training. 34 will be academic and will cover such subjects as flight characteristics of jet aircraft and related psychology... Aircraft engineering, basic instruments, navigation, and weather. 42 hours will be flight training, which includes approximately 20 hours in the air. And uh, you won't be qualified combat pilots when you finish. It takes more than three weeks to teach a man enough for that. But you will be trained sufficiently to do the jobs that are ahead of you. Now, you Air Defense Command and Headquarters Air Force men will be qualified as base commanders and squadron leaders where jets are involved. You MATS pilots will be indoctrinated in jet operations. You men from the Continental Air Command will be prepared for setting up reserve units for the 12th and 14th Air Forces and so on. And now, uh, outside of the actual indoctrination course, there are additional things that you may find useful for the future, like visiting runway control, the refueling section, and special maintenance. Now, these visits are optional, of course, but are sure to help you to a more complete understanding of your future duties, whatever they may be. Uh, and one more thing... As I look around here, I see a very normal situation for J.I.C. There are 14 of you in this class, and eight of you outrank me. Ten of you outrank Jim here. Now, please, gentlemen, remember that we are the instructors and you are the students. There are times when we will have to give you orders. They will only be meant to help. Now, you have your schedules, gentlemen. Your next stop is personal equipment. We'll find personal equipment in that Quonset hut right next to base operations down the flight line. Take it easy, get plenty of rest. There's no picnic that you have ahead of you. We're at 30,000 feet now, Colonel. And unless you keep pretty still, you're going to feel the effects of hypoxia. Would you go over that again, please? Uh, what is hypoxia exactly, Captain? Well, in the first place, I've instructed you all to remain seated. The reason for that is when the body lacks sufficient oxygen, as yours does now, in this high-altitude chamber at 30,000, the slightest exertion will make you black out. And that goes for me, too, even though I've been in here many times before. Now, not only that, but before you reach the blackout point, you'll find it very difficult to perform even the simplest task. Right. Now, to illustrate what I mean, Colonel, will you come over here to this table, please? Sure thing. All right, now move slowly now. Okay. There you are. Now, on this table before you is a board with holes in it. Next to the board are pegs that fit into these holes. Would you place the correct pegs in the correct holes? Well, that... Uh, that should be easy. 
Now, let's see. Uh, that one goes... Well, where, where does it go? It's round, but... All right, concentrate, Colonel. It's a round peg. It goes in... A round hole. That's right. Now, can you put it there? Well, I... I don't know. I'll try. Uh, Sergeant Chamberlain, put an oxygen mask on the colonel quickly. Yes, sir. After you all have had a try at the board to see the effects of hypoxia, we will figuratively return to the ground. You'll get your seat ejection training. Pay attention to the instructor. For if you have to get out of a jet traveling at five or six hundred miles per hour... One mistake is one too many. Now, General Squires, you're next. Will you come over here, please, sir? Hey, hi, Dad. What are you doing over here at this hour? Class is over for today. Yeah, it is. I thought I'd go over to runway control and look around. You feeling all right? Sure, sure. A little tired, though. I've been studying four and five hours a night. The old noggin doesn't absorb as fast as it used to. Oh, now, don't worry, Dad. Everyone has the same trouble. From what I hear, you're at the top of the class. Hi, Colonel. How's it coming? All well, right. I think we have a worrier on our hands, Walt. A worrier? Mm-hmm. Dad's been here a week, and he's worrying that he's not going to make it. Oh, no, it's not that, really. I just feel I'm not getting the most out of all there is to learn in this course. Well, sir, we've trained a lot of senior officers here, and I can tell you one thing for sure. We never lost a father yet. (laughs) Well, Colonel, that's your pre-flight briefing. Are there any questions? My head's so crammed with facts and figures and emergency procedures, I'm dizzy. It'll probably take me the next six months to get them sorted out. You think so now, Colonel, but when you get up in that plane tomorrow on your first dual flight, you'll change your mind. It's amazing just how fast you learn to put those theoretical facts into practical use. Perfect. But remember, it's theory you've been spotting. You should ever have to perform emergency procedures when you're in a plane, and I hope you don't. It's the execution that counts. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Well, that's it then. We've gone over the maps of the local flying area, radio stations, how to fill out the flight reports, acrobatic maneuvers, landing and takeoff instructions. Everything you need to know. And now, before we quit for the day, may I make a suggestion? Well, of course. Eat simply but well tonight and tomorrow morning and get plenty of sleep. Remember, tomorrow you're entering a new world of flight for the first time, the world of jet. See you at 11.30 hours here at 2.13. Right, Captain. Tomorrow's D-Day. Duel at 11.30 hours. You are listening to the Proudly We Hail production, 76 Hours. We'll return in just a moment for the second act of our story. Young man, an interesting career lies ahead of you if you can qualify as an aircraft observer in your United States Air Force. As a flying officer, you'll be an important member of the fighting team on one of the great aircraft produced in this era of jet aviation. The United States Air Force needs these technical specialists, officer personnel skilled in navigation, aircraft maintenance, radar interception, and other important skills. There's a future for you as an aircraft observer in your country's Air Force. Can you qualify? Well, if you're single, between 19 and 26 and a half, and a high school graduate, visit your nearest Air Force base or your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station and find out. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. Now, the second act of our story, 76 Hours. It's Friday morning of Colonel Frank Kennedy's second week in the Jet Indoctrination course at Craig Air Force Base, Alabama. In his head are facts and figures, thousands of them. 
As he walks out to the T-33 on the flight line, they buzz around in his head like a thousand bees. He's heard all about jets. He's studied all about them. Now, his first flight. He's piloted propeller-driven planes, dodged ACAC fire, fought his way through swarms of enemy fighters. But this is a new world, a new age. And there's a little doubt. Maybe he isn't young enough for this world. Maybe. Here she is, number 208. She's a beautiful plane. Hope I do well by her. Don't you worry about it, thing, sir. You'll do fine. Now, let's check her over first. That's a must before every takeoff. Roger. As you were told, an academic, sir, start with the landing gear, checking the brakes, the connections, the hydraulic system, and the tires. Can you see? Roger. This wheel seems to be okay. Now for the other one. You, you take over. Roger. Brakes seem to be okay. Connections are secure. Hydraulic system's okay. Tires seem to be just about right. Roger. Now let's go over the surface of the plane. Every outside surface should be clean, smooth, and securely riveted. After that, we check the tailpipe, the engine blades, and the air intake duct. If any of these things didn't function properly in the air when you were hightailing it along at five or six hundred miles per hour, <laughs> you wouldn't be in the least bit happy. Well, that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> Well, now for the fuel tanks. We start with a wingtip tank on one side and work across the plane. The tanks, as you can see, open by unscrewing. Now, this tip tank is full. This wing tank is, too. Okay, sir, let's climb in. Now, this first time, I'll see to it that you're in securely. After this, it'll be up to you. Thank you. Now, slip your parachute harness over your shoulders. All right, now attach the tube coming from your oxygen mask to the plane's oxygen supply. Put your helmet on and adjust your oxygen mask to fit your face securely. Roger. Everything's done. Good. Now, be sure to keep your arms clear of the canopy once I get in, because when I lock it, it's really going to slam shut. As soon as I get set, we'll get our engine started and we'll be off. We'll be talking on the intercom. Roger. Oxygen on full, Colonel. I'm closing the canopy. We'll be a little warm till we get off the ground. Roger. Safety belt secure, Colonel. A few minutes, we'll be in the blue. goes the old man, Walt. Yeah, Betty's excited. No doubt about that. Funny, isn't it? What? Ever since I was born, my father's worried about me. Now I'm the one who's worrying about him. Bubbles, 208, taxi. 208, taxi 14. Roger. That's the whole takeoff chatter, Colonel. We'll be off in a moment now. What I can see, everyone's going up. Yeah, practically everyone is. Your class is having its first fuel day. The class ahead of you is soloing. And then the pilot instructor school are flying today, too. Well, here we go. Cut your oxygen supply back to normal at 5,000 feet. Roger. As soon as we get up to 10,000, I'll reduce power to about 96%. Then we'll go on up to 30,000. Saves fuel. These planes burn about 15 gallons a minute on the ground, don't they? Roger. And only about four or five at 30,000. That's why we get up there so fast. It feels awful far away for being airborne such a short time. Yes. Because these jets move so fast and because students are not familiar with navigation problems while moving at high speeds... A lot of them get lost at least once while in the school. Uh, we're only doing 350. Wait till we really open her up. I'm waiting. 
Now, you see that dial on your right, the G-force dial? I know. Well, that shows the gravitational pull on the plane. See, the idea is that your body is moving one way, and suddenly it's pulled another. During the few moments when the body's force is in one direction and the mechanical pull is in the other, the force in the body, that is to say the pull, is tremendous. Roger. Now, one of the first things we always do is to give you a taste of G-forces at work. After you fly jets a lot, you'll be able to take up to eight Gs without blacking out. I'll only get up to four or five this time. The blacking out comes when the blood in the head rushes to the feet as the body stops moving in one direction suddenly. Uh, tighten your stomach muscles and your throat muscles and the blood won't be able to get down so easily. It prevents blackout. Roger. And the best maneuver for getting the G-forces up without diving and pulling up sharply is to make a really tight turn. You ready for one now? Ready as I'll ever be. Here we go. Two Gs. Three Gs. How goes it? Your body's now being subjected to a pull three times out of normal gravity. I'm still with you. Three and a half. Four. Four and a half Gs. Are you all right, Colonel? Colonel! Come out of it, Colonel! Well, what do you know? He's blacked out. Had enough, Dad? Just about. Well, how was the first ride today? Oh, it was great. Except I... Blacked out at four G's. Oh, that's pretty good. I blacked out at three on my first flight. No. You're kidding, of course. I'm not kidding. If you remember hearing the instructor say four and seeing it on the dial, you did real well. Well, that's encouraging to hear. You're doing fine, Dad. You have up till now. All right, I'm convinced. Well, you'll have to excuse me early tonight, though. I'm practically asleep. Of course, Dad. Finish your dessert and go quietly. You know, I find I need twice as much sleep down here as I used to in Washington. Well, that's natural. You're burning up twice as much energy. Have another piece of pie, Dad. If you're really working as hard as Jim says you are, you not only need twice as much sleep, but three times as much to eat. <laughs> <laughs> midst of your first solo. How are you feeling? Proud of yourself, aren't you? Weren't sure you'd get this far. Well, you have. You've recorded instrument readings at various altitudes. You've practiced chandelles, lazy eights, loops, and all the rest. You're almost ready to go home. Now, let's see. According to the gauges, you've got about 150 gallons of fuel left. Plenty to get home with. Uh-oh. Now, where's the base? Well, Colonel, this is a fine kettle of fish. You're lost. I remember that we were told during your first ride that getting lost is an easy thing to do when you first start flying jets. They move so fast. And in unfamiliar territory, lots of people get confused. Well, guess I'm no different, because I'm lost, but good. Better ask Maxwell Direction Finder for a little help. Maxwell DF, this is Air Force Jet 208. Request steer to base. Roger, transmitting for steer. Roger, Maxwell DF, my steer to Maxwell is 144 degrees, steer to Craig is 178. Thank you, and out. Come on, Colonel, let's go home. Who are you watching, Jim? Dad, he's just coming in from his final solo. That him on the approach now? Mm Mm-hmm. 208. That plane's his baby. He really loves her. He's been a fine student. He's going to do a swell job when he gets to Great Falls. Oh, don't I know it. Ah, His wheels are on the ground. That was a great A landing. Mm Mm-hmm. How about that? You never doubted he'd make it, did you, Jim? No, never. But he is almost 50, Walt, and 
Well, I was afraid he'd have a rough time. Not me. First time I met him, I said to myself, the old boy's going to be all right. He takes after his son. Gloria, where's Mom? Oh, she's out in the kitchen making more sandwiches. I asked her not to, but you know her. She has to help. Oh, my. She just finished closing a ten-room house traveling 750 <laughs> miles down here, and she has to be a hostess. What a gal. Where's the J.I.C. grad? I haven't seen him for the last few minutes, either. Oh, he's over there with Walt. Oh. Hey, just a minute, everybody. Hold it down to a roar, huh? Oh, is this the toast? I'll get Mom. You better start there as quiet as ever going to be. I guess you're right. Ladies and gentlemen, may I propose a toast? I'd like to see somebody stop you. <laughs> I want to toast my old man. Here, here. <laughs> now, Dad, the first day you came down here, you said you were nervous about starting the course at JIC. And I said that for you, it'd be duck soup. Well, maybe it wasn't as easy as that, but you did a great job. You thought you were too old, but you proved you weren't. So here's to you, to the youngest old man in the Air Force, Colonel Frank Kennedy. <laughs> That was wonderful, Jim. Now, do you think you can maneuver the youngest old man into the kitchen? Well, I think so. Secrets, or may I come too? Of course you can. I'll take mother. Okay, Mrs. Mystery. <laughs> Dad, Gloria wants us in the kitchen. I'm coming. Well, we're here, honey. Now, what's the mystery? I have sort of a present for Dad. I've already told Mom. Oh, that's a funny kind of present. Kind of, but... I think he'll like it. Just came today. You see, Dad, the Kennedy family is going to have a new aviation cadet in the family. Why, Gloria. Why, that's the nicest present I've ever had. Between graduating from J.I.C. and this, why, it's the most wonderful day of my life. <laughs> Young man, there's a future in flight. Today's jet age offers unlimited opportunities for young men between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half who are high school graduates and otherwise qualified. Yes, you can proudly wear the silver wings and fly the mighty aircraft of your United States Air Force when you've completed your training. For full details, visit your nearest Air Force base or your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station today. Remember, the sooner you apply, the sooner you fly. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. Proudly We Hail.